Thanks very much. TeachAIDS was designed to solve one specific problem, and it grew from there. Originally, the main focus was trying to figure out how to be able to provide HIV education in parts of the world where the topic was so taboo that you couldn't even talk about it. So the place where we started was India. In India a few years ago, they had some incidences where sex education was actually banned in multiple states across the country. So in 10 states out of India's 28 states, they had banned sex education and the nationally produced HIV curriculum was disallowed in various school systems around the entire country. So the challenge was, how do you provide this essential education when the stigma levels are so high and the taboos are so great that you can't even discuss it openly? So in order to solve this, my wife worked with a team of experts at Stanford where she was doing her graduate work and tried to figure out how to be able to provide this education without confronting the topic directly. How do you actually discuss something openly when you can't touch on some of the key elements that would be expected in the United States? So in the United States, it's pretty much accepted that if you say that something is health education, then you can show just about whatever you want after that. You can be as explicit as you want because of the fact that you're educating and it's necessary to provide that clarity. But when that same approach is taken to other parts of the world and you actually show very explicit videos, not only do you have these types of curricula get rejected, but you actually have protests in the street. So one of the things that happened in India was the national curriculum which was created to teach about HIV was burned in the streets by the educators to whom it was delivered. So there were obviously some very great stigma issues. So in order to get around this, five years of research went into creating a brand new curriculum, a brand new pedagogical approach. And this was based on a fundamental shift from the way that HIV had been taught about in the past. So hundreds of millions of dollars have been spent over the course of the last 30 years on HIV education in all of the countries in the world where HIV has been such a great problem. And the problem with that education has been it's focused on awareness rather than true education. Now just think for a minute about what that distinction is because it's not always clear. In fact, in most cases when people talk about HIV education, they're talking about these awareness campaigns. So the difference is that there is a huge difference between people being aware of HIV being a problem, being aware of the fact that it's dangerous and there are various ways that they can get it, and truly understanding when they're at risk and when they're not at risk. So an example of this is called the ABC campaign. Abstain, be faithful, and use condoms. So people would see billboards and 30-second TV commercials put up all over the world talking about these three principles, and they would start to believe that they actually understood how to be able to prevent HIV and prevent themselves from getting it. But the problem was that the research showed that they had a very superficial understanding. So even in places like India, where the stigma levels were extremely high, awareness was still high. People were aware of the fact that HIV was a problem and they would think that, oh, I just need to abstain or I need to be faithful and I need to use condoms. But the problem was that as soon as you delved one level deeper than that, to ask them in tests, which we did, how exactly is HIV transmitted and how is it prevented by using condoms or being faithful, they didn't know the answers. So for example, in some parts of India, the idea of being faithful meant being faithful to one sex worker. Now that's not really going to prevent you from getting HIV. <laughs> the idea of abstaining wasn't clear either. What exactly are you abstaining from? The definitions of what constituted sex would vary from region to region and from activity to activity. And as far as using condoms, we know that throughout the world there are challenges in making people understand what the correct way to use condoms is and you know where do you actually uh, apply that. So in Rwanda, for example, there's uh, a language problem where the word for condom is actually the same as the word for sock. And what that meant was that there were men who would go to bed wearing one sock. And they would think that that was what they needed to do to prevent uh, themselves from getting HIV. So one of the things that we realized as we scaled across the world was that there were extremely important issues in terms of translation that we needed to deal with. So I'd like to tell you about some of those design issues that went into creating the software to be able to address this problem. So one of the key issues was 
the languages, like I was mentioning. So you have to be able to not only communicate effectively and accurately, but you need to be able to really connect with the audience that you're delivering the message to. So what that means is that if somebody sees a curriculum or a tutorial that appears like it's created from another country and is now being used in your country or it's created by another region and is now being used in your region, then it starts to feel like HIV is somebody else's problem. And this is exactly one of the major issues with stigma. You, there are groups throughout the world who are stigmatized and it's very easy to say, oh, well, you know, that's not me. It doesn't affect my country, it doesn't affect my people, it doesn't affect people who speak my language. So it was extremely important to create versions of our tutorials which were in their own languages, in people's own accents, and using the right types of representations from a visual perspective. So one of the things that you might have caught in the video was that the way that we're delivering HIV education is through animated tutorials. And not only is there a great deal of pedagogical research which has gone into the structure of those tutorials, but it's also incorporated the voices and the likenesses of celebrities from each of these countries. So, for example, in India, we went to Bollywood and we brought on celebrities from the Bollywood film industry as well as from even smaller film industries throughout India. So there are also, there's the Tollywood film industry where you have Telugu uh, language films that are produced. And we had a big launch in Andhra Pradesh, which had one of the highest stigma levels in the entire country uh, that incorporated various Tollywood celebrities. In Botswana, the biggest celebrities are recording artists. So those recording artists were actually the folks that we reached out to, as well as the Ministry of Education and the uh, former president's office in order to be able to launch there. So, the main benefit of using those celebrities was not only being able to really connect with the audiences, which were primarily students that we were talking to, but also to be able to generate a sense of excitement. So th this was one of the key design decisions, making sure that we had the ability to produce a product which was going to be used no matter what the reason was. So, there were many folks that would look at this and they would say, oh, well, I'm going to use this education because of the fact that it's coming from Stanford. I want to teach about HIV, therefore I want something which is going to be medically accurate, and they wouldn't need to look any further. There would be other folks that would say, I want a new way to be able to connect with children on this topic, particularly in places like Sub-Saharan Africa, where they've heard so much about HIV because of the prevalence rates being so high over the course of the last 30 years that they don't want to hear anything more about it. So the way to be able to connect with uh, uh, children in that context was to show them something that they had never seen before, which was high quality animations in their own languages starring celebrities that they recognized. So being able to see these types of high quality products that were designed for them was really novel. And that was a perfectly fine reason for using it as well. But ultimately, we wanted folks around the world to use this approach because of the fact that it had the highest efficacy rates. It had the highest learning effects. It had the highest retention effects when we did conducted post-tests several months later. And it also had the highest comfort and acceptance rates, which we discovered through the research was so important in making sure that not only that the, the learning effects were achieved, but also that people were willing to utilize these curricula and distribute it around their countries. So in Andhra Pradesh, for example, where I told you before, they had previously banned sex education and they had such high stigma levels, the government is now actually distributing the software throughout all of their state schools, throughout uh, health education centers, and throughout various counseling facilities. So this is an important step forward in being able to bring HIV education for the very first time to millions of people who have never had it before. But in Botswana, for example, they, in Sub-Saharan Africa, they did something uh, which was even more remarkable, which was they declared June 15th of this year to be National Teach AIDS Day. And they actually held various functions around the entire country that day, teaching about a topic that folks had heard so much about over the course of 30 years that they felt that there wasn't anything new that they could really learn, that there wasn't anything new in terms of an approach to really bring. So, what we've discovered was that by concentrating on this new pedagogical approach, we were able to bridge various HIV challenges around the world. 
we were able to deal not only with the scenarios where HIV education was so taboo that it wasn't provided at all, but also the scenarios where HIV was so prevalent that people didn't want to hear any more about it. So th the core reason here that they were able to use this in all of these contexts was because of the fact that it was real education as opposed to awareness. So those 30-second TV spots and the, the large billboards that people would see wouldn't actually result in people being able to not reason in novel situations. So they might be able to memorize a list of do's and don'ts. Do do the following things, don't do the following things in order to avoid getting HIV. But the problem was that as soon as they would be asked a question or encounter a situation that they'd never seen before, suddenly they wouldn't know what the right answer was because they didn't have an internal framework of how HIV was actually transmitted. And the reason that HIV awareness campaigns functioned this way over the course of all of this time was because people assumed that in order to get a message out to a large audience, audience, you really needed to you know, turn it into bite-sized chunks. When you think about education in general, and that's not the way that it works. That's not the way that you provide math education. You don't have billboards that say 1 plus 1 equals 2 and other billboards that say 4 times 5 equals 20 and hope that eventually the message is going to sink in. You actually have to spend time teaching the me mechanics of how mathematics works and then students are able to internalize that and reason in those novel situations in order to solve problems on their own. So the task of the research team at Stanford was to figure out how do you create this this internal representation of knowledge? And the answer was, teach it like you teach other subjects. Teach it like you teach biology. Teach it like you teach uh, mathematics. Provide them with the building blocks that they need in order to then have the necessary scaffolding to learn additional per region, per country types of uh, knowledge. So this biological approach was really something that allowed, for the first time, HIV education to be decoupled from sex education. By emphasizing first that HIV is a virus, just like any other virus, and here's how it works in the human body, that was the key to being able to provide HIV education in places where even sex education as a whole was banned. And this also allowed students to start to internalize for the first time what HIV was, because they might have heard a lot about it. They might have heard of it as this boogeyman, or might have heard about the horror stories, in, particularly in places like Sub-Saharan Africa, of the, the high prevalence rates and so, so many people dying. So in Botswana, again, for example, you have more than a nearly a quarter of the population that's HIV positive in terms of the adult population. That, that's something that we can't even relate to in the United States to have such a high HIV uh, positive population. And what that means is that everyone in the country knows people who have died of HIV. And that's the case for so much of Sub-Saharan Africa. But in other parts of the world, there's still a great amount of ignorance, even in places where they don't have as much direct, first-hand experience with HIV. And fear-based curricula, which would go in and say, here are the ways that you should avoid HIV, and here's why you should be afraid of it, in some cases might spur people into being more afraid, but it would also stigmatize people who are HIV positive. And what we discovered was that by focusing on that biological approach, we were able to not only create that internalized knowledge so that students would have a full understanding of how to protect themselves against HIV, but it would also result in lower stigma levels because people would start to understand that HIV wasn't this uh, demon. It wasn't this boogeyman. It was a virus, just like any other virus, and here's how it worked, and here's how they could protect themselves. So, in terms of the design process and the scaling process, th this was an ideal use of technology. There's been a lot of debate uh, over the last several years about what the proper role, and, and at this conference as well, about what the proper role of technology is in the classroom. Now, imagine if you had a subject where teachers actually didn't even want to teach that subject, and students didn't want to learn that subject from their teachers. Imagine a subject that it was suddenly a teacher's obligation to teach about, but they didn't feel like they had sufficient mastery in it. Well, that's the case with HIV. And this is an ideal application of technology because of the fact that it allows consistent education to be delivered in places where you just don't have the ability to be able to provide it in any other way. So, 
That's the last thing that I'd like to leave you with. In terms of product design, it's so important to be able to just address all of the different issues that are associated with a product and make sure that it's high quality from a visual design perspective, from a distribution perspective, and from a product design perspective so that there's no reason not to use it. Thank you very much.